Greetings, I'm DK Ronsner. Welcome back to the TTT News. Section 41 of the Environmental Management Act speaks to environmentally sensitive species. We are going in depth on the definition and implication of such with Technical Officer 2 Biodiversity at the EMA, Daniel Lewis Clark. Welcome, Daniel. How are you doing? I am well, thank you very much. And thank you for making the time. I want us to start from the ground up, though, please. What do you define as an environmentally sensitive species? Well, according to Section 41 of the Environmental Management Act, because the EMA is got Environmental Management Authority is governed by the Environmental Management Act. So according to Section 41, an environmentally sensitive species is any living plant or animal requiring special protection. Now, although the Act only gives that very brief definition, the subsidiary legislation, the Environmentally Sensitive Species Rules, provides for more, gives some more detail regarding what are some of the parameters that we consider when we want to designate environmentally sensitive species. So things that we look for, is the species unique? Is it indigenous to Trinidad and Tobago? or although not indigenous, is part of Trin is found in Trinidad for a portion of his life cycle or for reproductive cycle? Is it important for research pharmaceuticals? Does it have aesthetic value? Is it, does it have unique taxonomy? Does it fall under um, international, one of our international conventions that we the Trinidad Tobago has signed on to? For example, Convention of Biological Diversity, or is it mentioned in local legislation, such as the Conservation of Wildlife Act, or does the species generally contribute to um, conservation of biodiversity for Trinidad and Tobago? So that should just name a few out of the plethora of characteristics. And, you, and that's, a, that's a mouthful, and we're going to go into some of them because there's some I want to I want to ask about specifically. But what are some of the reasons that you'd find a species becoming environment, environmentally sensitive? It's more along the lines of its uniqueness or whether or not it is threatened. So most of our environmentally sensitive species that currently exist are threatened by human disturbance, poaching, habitat loss, or they are unique to Trinidad and Tobago, where meaning they're not found anywhere else but here. And so if we lose the species, it will be lost forever. And it will be a global loss and a regional loss and a local loss. Understood, thank you for that. Now, there's one of the things that you said, it may not be, it may not be, oh originating from Trinidad and Tobago, but it spends part of its life cycle there. And what are some of those, what are some of those species that you'd find uh, fulfilling that characteristic? Right now we don't, we have not designated any species that fulfills that characteristic, but it is one of the considerations that we would take on if it is that a species of that nature comes on. Um, for example, um, at one point in time, the scarlet ibis was, th was thought to only visit our shores to roost. But over time, persons may have realized that it's a resident here. Well, that, that's, what, that's what I was wondering about. <laughs> no, it's a resident. So it's, it's constantly found, mainly in the Karuni Swamp. And then you may find it in other areas um, during times where they, they fly to roost and things like that. I know this, I'm, I'm really glad we're having this conversation because you're actually um, making me more aware of these sorts of things as well. But I want to go into the, the process a little bit of designation. So how is it that we say, okay, well, I want to go from this point where it is not under that designation to the steps to say, okay, well, now it is designated as an environmentally sensitive species. Right, so there are a number of ways we can go about it. Um, early on in the designation process, we would have, um, the EMA would have conducted stakeholder engagement exercises or consultation exercises. And those stakeholders would have identified key species that they, the key, the experts deem require special protection based on the parameters set out in the EM Act 
and the environmentally sensitive species rules. And they would have come up with a list and ranked. So the first set of designations would have followed that um, ranking system. And then as the designations evolved, it would have been based on um, threats to the species or uniqueness. So that process, that's the starting of the process. And once it's the EMA determines that yes, the species falls within all the or meets the requirements to become an environmentally sensitive species, we then go into the four phase process, which I could go into more detail about. So the first phase, it's basically data collection and gathering. We would have do um, call for research, do internet reviews, literature search, key stakeholder interviews. And then what the EMA would do is use all that information we have collected and then we develop the initial draft of the legal notice of the species. I will go into the, the details of the legal notice later on. So once we have that initial draft, we then send it out to key stakeholders involved in conservation of the species. We allow them the opportunity to review and provide feedback to us because we understand that we don't have all the answers. So we allow persons to help us along with the process and collaborate with them. Once those comments come back in, we review and we amend the legal notice. And that version of the legal notice, is, so that's phase one. So that's the draft legal notice stage. Then phase two, that legal note, that draft legal notice then goes out for public comment following section 28.1 of the Environmental Management Act that gives us the guidelines on how to conduct public comment. So we prepare an administrative record, which gives you details, more details regarding the species and a justification as to why we think the species should be designated and also provides a copy of the draft legal notice. It then, that document is then lodged at public locations for a minimum of 30 days. Um, and it's also lodged at our website. So anybody could go in, review and provide feedback on the draft legal notice. And it's lodged in both Trinidad and Tobago. Once that phase is completed now, the comments, we review the comments received during the process and then we revise the legal notice again. Once that is completed, the legal notice is finalized and we then send the document to be gazetted. It's only at that phase, once the document is gazetted, then the species can be considered designated and environmentally sensitive species. It must be signed and gazetted. Then that's the third phase. And then we move into the last phase. So now that we have the final legal notice, we prepare a notice of the final action. And this is really our feedback mechanism because persons would provide comments and they don't know how their comments are treated. So this is the opportunity for us to outline how we address your comments and to present to the country the final legal notice. That document is then lodged at the same locations we would have used during the public comment period for a minimum of 45 days. And that sort of sums up the process. And going in through that process, I want us to take a break now because when we return from the break, I want to ask about what are the species that are on the list at this point in time? Because knowing what are the, the species that are on the list, we can then ask about the stakeholders who are involved. So we do that and we are speaking with Daniel Lewis Clark. We, we return in just a bit. We're speaking about environmentally sensitive species. Stay with us, we return with more. Welcome back. We are going in depth on environmentally sensitive species. We're doing so with technical officer to biodiversity at the Environmental Management Authority, Daniel Lewis Clark. And just before we took the break, you gave us that very thorough set of steps, the processes. But I want to know what are the species on the list at this point in time, Ms. Clark Lewis or Ms. Lewis Clark, rather, so that from then we find out who are some of those stakeholders that you all have been engaging. So we currently have 11 species designated as environmentally sensitive species. 
We have the Pawi, also known as the Trinidad Pipe and Guan. We have the um, Golden Tree Frog, Ocelot. Five species of turtles, which are the leather, Leatherback, Loggerhead, Olive Ridley, Hawksville, Green Turtle. Then we have the Manatee, the, and now of course I'm going through the list. I would lose, lose my trend of thought. Um, Humanity, then the, did I say the golden tree frog? Yes, is the scarlet ibis still there? Yes, the scarlet ibis would be the most recent. And then we also have the white-tailed saber-winged hummingbird. So those in essence are the 11. And I guess with that, with that itemization of those 11 species, it helps to ask the question of who are the stakeholders who are who are in, in involved, who you engage? Well, it depends on the species. So each species will have its own um, key experts involved. So for example, the scarlet ibis, which is most recently designated, we would have involved um, almost all of the government ministries. And then we would have involved the stakeholders involved in protection, day-to-day -day protection and management of the species, which will be those stakeholders associated with the Karani swamp the tour guides, um, forestry division. And then we also have those who, the tour guides resident at Karani Swamp, as well as those who visit and bring persons in from, from other regions. For example, um, as well as we will have key stakeholders like the vet school of the University of the West Indies, the um, University of Trinidad and Tobago, because those are our key academic research persons. Um, and then we also have individuals who we may bring in based on their expertise in the area. So it depends on the species we're looking at and who we will do a stakeholder analysis to determine who are our stakeholders we should engage. And that just kind of goes to show how far, uh, how far reaching stakeholders can be. And the fact that you have people who wouldn't in, in, interact with some of these spe species on a day-to-day -day basis because this is what they make their livelihood from, then you, then you underscore the importance of research as it leads to policy development, so right. involving the academia, so that everything kind of goes hand in hand and it's an all hands on deck approach. And right. how, how has that been working thus far in terms of having these stakeholders and getting feedback from them? What kind of feedback do you normally get? It has been, like... It's been valuable feedback because we would develop the legal notice based on the information we would have collected. But then there are those persons who are intimately involved with the species. Um, conservation groups, for example, for example, the sea turtles, they have the conservation groups who do monitoring during the turtle nesting season. They have intimate knowledge of the species. So they are, once we make sure and engage them, they provide their feedback and it may not be documented in a research paper but it's anecdotal information and that in itself has proven very useful for us because it has provided us with information that we would not have been able to get anywhere else so our those key, st key stakeholders are very much valuable to our process and how important is it that uh, even outside of writing policies or legal notices you have this kind of conversation, ongoing dialogue with these stakeholders, because I'm sure uh, EMA suffers a lack of resources as everyone else does. So in terms of being able to monitor, say, okay, well, this is happening at this point in time and to get a real time information. Uh, what is that like? So what we do is we always have our, we build our relationships with them and not just build, we build and maintain our relationships. We collaborate with them on a regular basis. So we have that, open line of communication. And yes, we do have resource constraints, but we have made it our mandate to work with our partners, um, persons with key, well, our key, other key stakeholders that we can work with in order to resolve the challenges that we have. So enforcement wise, we do have partners that we work with um, that when an issue arises, we seek to address it in the best way possible, utilizing our collaborative approach. What are some of those things that the, these, these stakeholders, these groups that are doing their business and saying, okay, well, it makes sense for us to link with you or to talk to you because, what are some of the because? Because it, they are 
intimately involved with the species and they see the value in working with us in order to protect and conserve the species. So they see the importance of us and always willing, because once the lines of, as I said, the lines of communication, we always maintain and we keep very much open. The feedback mechanism is important. So they see the value because it results in the protection of the species, which filters. And at the end of the day, it's their job and it's their lifeline. It's some that they use in order to generate um, income. So it's a, um, it's a, um, it's a good mechanism for the both parties. And what about a little wide and, and carrying that net a little wider out? So there's someone who is a member of the public, they're not necessarily a member of a group, and they see something and they say, but wait now, I think I heard something about this. I wonder if that's a golden tree frog. I wonder if this is a... So, and but they're not a member of a group. How do they make a complaint, say, okay, well, I saw this, I observed this, uh, and get on to the EMA like that? Well, we do have um, the EMA have its complaints line that we usually um, share on social media, on our web page and all of that. So that mechanism, we persons can use that outlet, whether through our WhatsApp number or call directly our EMA complaints number, or sometimes persons call me directly. So we have various um, uh, modes by which persons, even members of the public could call, they could send emails, almost all we make sure that we address each one as they come in and that and all that information in terms of like the complaints and other platforms this is on the this is on the website it's on our EMA's website as well as well as our social media platforms all right and I think sometimes we may we may say okay well I'm not hearing anything about them it have not it have, it, there's no problem with them um right. What would you tell the person who says that? I would say that although you're not hearing, it's because it's probably not publicized. But uh, if you do talk to persons, if you talk to us, as well as other conservation groups involved in the conservation and protection of the species, they can give you full details as to what is going on with the species on a generally a day-to-day -day basis. So you may not hear, but they are very much threatened on a daily basis. So in terms of these 11 species that are that fall under this designation, uh, is there, what kind of movement is there? So you said the, the, the most recent one under the designation is the Scarlet Ibis. Uh, are there any that you see maybe moving off of the list in anytime soon? Are there any that be, be moving onto the list anytime soon? Because I see we, we, have no, we have no flora there yet. So Right, correct. Um, we don't have any flora thing, I guess. yet. Yeah, we don't have any flora yet. Um, there may be species moving off the list, but that is subject to a little more research and having the robust scientific information for us to make that decision. Um, and I don't think just yet we're ready for that, but you never know because things, some of the species have improved over time in terms of their status, which is a good sign but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready to be off the list just yet. In terms of other species that will be coming on the list, we have two species that will be coming on the list, we hope in the shortest time possible, which is the Trinidad howler monkey and the Trinidad capuchin, white fronted capuchin. So those we are actually in the process and coming, to, coming down to the, we're in the third phase of the process now and coming down to the end of the designation process. So those two should be coming on shortly. Well, look, you, you're piquing my interest now. And in the sense that what, so each, each species that reaches onto the list, there would be factors. Say, so, okay, well, it's because of this, it's because of that. What are, what, what are some of those factors specifically for the howler monkey and, the, and, and, and that Capuchin. capuchin monkey that you would have described? Particularly um, poaching, which is illegal hunting. Um, habitat loss and the pet trade. So most people, for some reason, would like to have the monkeys as a pet, um, which is not necessarily the best idea, but it is an issue in terms of not just local pet trade, but pet trade in terms of trading internationally. So for those reasons, we have decided to designate those particular two species. 
Okay, thank you so much, Daniel Lewis Clark. We want to thank you for your time, as well as the work that your organization is doing, the stakeholders that you interact with, who many of these do this, apart from just from, from professionally as a labor of love. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Rasta. Thank you so much for joining us.